Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Beneath the Surface talk on Operation JWIC and CampEx. Uh, my name is Sterling Smith. I work here at the Australian National Maritime Museum on the interpretation and management of our Naval Heritage Collection, including the NV Pride. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation of the, as the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we work. I also acknowledge all traditional custodians on the land and waters through Australia and pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Mountain and I also work at the Australian National Maritime Museum at Galling Harbour in the capacity of a violent volunteer guide within the Volunteer Guide Program. As part of my duties, I've been given the opportunity to be able to teach and instruct people and visitors as employees in regards to Operation JWIC and Camp X. On the 80th anniversary of Operation JWIC on the 26th of September, let us take the opportunity to reflect on the significance and importance of this World War II military operation. A combined force of both British and Australian Navy Army personnel travelled to Singapore in the MV Crite to inflict a unprecedented amount of damage to enemy shipping vessels that were milled in Keppel Harbour during the, the World War II. Eighty years on, the Crite is part of the Australian War Memorial Collection and most graciously has been on loan to the Australian National Maritime Museum for visitors to view, admire and reflect upon the sacrifice and tenacity that these servicemen made in the defence of our country in the British Empire vessels that was built and constructed to uh, assist the Japanese fishing fleet in Singapore before the commencement of World War II. Her original name was the Kafuku Maru, which in translation into English is good fortune or happiness. Just a photograph there, a construction cross-section of the actual vessel itself. Okay, on the 7th of December 1941, when the Imperial Japanese launched into Pearl Harbour, the Kafuka Maru was docked in Singapore. The vessel, as I mentioned before, had been employed to support the fishing fleet, whose area of operation was in the proximity to the Anibis Islands, northeast of Singapore. At the time, there was an Australian master mariner, Bill Reynolds, was working in that area. Um, apparently, when he had heard of the Japanese entry into the war, he was then um, concerned about leaving Singapore. So he attended the the uh, harbour master in Singapore Harbour and was able to procure the Kafuka Maru, which enabled him to make his way away from Singapore before the arrival of Japanese. During this course of time, Reynolds actually, when he had the vessel up and running, was able to safely evacuate about 1,500 people away from Singapore to the surrounding islands of Sumatra, uh, Dutch East Indies area, and basically saved a lot of people from um, the invasion of the Japanese. At the same time, uh, Reynolds bumped into an English Army officer by the name of Ivan Lyon, who was also working in Singapore. He'd been attached to Singapore after um, completing his training at Sandhurst and was working in Singapore uh, before the commencement of World War II. He was also assisting people um, departing from Singapore before the arrival of the Japanese. At the time, both gentlemen realised that um, the Kafuka Maru at the time could basically move around freely in Singapore, um, undetected by the Japanese. So this gave the, the gentlemen both an idea that perhaps they could use the Krite at a later stage uh, throughout the war. So they managed to sail the vessel to Ceylon or Sri Lanka, and then they moved on to India, where they spoke to the British High Command and, in, and spoke to them in regards to um, being able to, to have a further military operation down the track. In 1942, uh, the Australians set up a special operations unit within Australia with the sanction of um, SOE, which is Special Operations Executive in the UK. Winston Churchill, after the evacuation of Dunkirk, had initiated a number of special organisations to be put in place to conduct covert and further operations against the enemy firstly in Europe and Africa against the Nazis. Then when the Japanese entered the war, they then also uh, provided the same support to um, Southeast and Pacific regions. Ivan Lyon, um, after speaking with the British military, uh, attended Australia and spoke to the Australian military and was able to uh, have it, the operation um, JWIC, which it was called, sanctioned by the Australian military. He then went out and commenced 
um, training of 13 volunteers who trained in an area of Hawkesbury River, which is about 48 kilometres northwest of, of Sydney. In January uh, 1943, the vessel was renamed the Crite, which is an Indian word for deadly snake, which was to be used on a deadly mission. They set out from Refuge Bay in Sydney, north, northern beaches of Sydney, and proceeded along the east coast of Australia, um, making their way eventually round to the coast at Exmouth. Okay, along the way between Sydney and Cairns, the vessel succumbed to uh, a lot of issues with the engine, and eventually an engine was procured in Tasmania, which held up the operation. So the vessel was was um, dock bound for quite a while until a new engine was fitted uh, in Cairns. After the vessel then had the new engine, it eventually made its way round to Exmouth in Western Australia. On the 2nd of September, 1943, after the arrival of all the equipment and all the um, requirements of the mission, the Crite departed uh, Exmouth and headed north towards Singapore. On the 6th of September, 1943, the Japanese flag was raised on the vessel uh, as it was heading in towards enemy waters. Before Lion and the team left Australia, they procured a large amount of um, cosmetic um, cream from um, Helena Rubenstein in Melbourne. And each day the crew would paint their skin with the foundation cream. And from a distance, the gentleman would, re would resemble a Malaysian fisherman in a Japanese vessel flying a Japanese flag. So this enabled the, the team to procure themselves and get into the Longbox Strait. And eventually they were able to get to the um, an area called uh, Padang Island, which is about 30 miles south of Singapore. So the idea of the mission was the Crite would drop off three teams of two commandos who would eventually paddle into Singapore Harbour. The Crite would then go out into the ocean around the Borneo and for a period of about 11 to 12 days would continue to operate as a fishing vessel whilst the crew members of the assault team would paddle close to Singapore. On the, around the, um, the 24th of September, the, the, the operatives had arrived at an island very close to Singapore, Dongus Island, and, and were proceeding in the evening on the 24th to paddle into Keppel Harbour, Singapore, and attack the vessels. Now, during the mission, the, the, um, the team was subjected to a lot of weather issues, particularly current. So on the evening of the... Um, of the, uh, the 24th, when they uh, left on the mission, after a number of hours, they had to call the mission off and return to a small island because the currents had been unfavourable, which would have left the raiding party vulnerable in the early daylight hours in the morning. So they rested for a number of days on a small island called Suba Island. And on the uh, evening of the 26th of September, 1943, the team set out from, from the island and made their way into Singapore Harbour. Um, at the time, the teams then broke up into three separate groups and then they went into the harbour sourcing their targets. Amongst the targets were many Japanese vessels, cargo vessels, which were very relevant for the invasion fleet. The Japanese had uh, a number of uh, supply vessels um, located in the harbour at that time. And the idea was to select their target and place limpet mines, which was a military mine, on these targets and then exit the, the harbour. This was done successfully. The timing was placed on the limpet mine for about five and a half hours, which gave the teams time to paddle in darkness back to Dongus Island. One of the team members, led by Lieutenant, um, Lieutenant Davison, headed south to the rendezvous point so he could at least keep in contact with the Crite for the rendezvous. The remaining two teams, led by um, the commander, Major Ivan Lyon, uh, stayed on the island of Dongus Island. And of the morning of the 27th of September 1943, between 5.15 and 6 o'clock, there was a large explosion in the harbour and a multiple damage to vessels um, accruing to about 37 tonnes of damage to Japanese vessels occurred um, within Singapore Harbour. After this, the team then left uh, the, um, the, the confines of the harbour and over a period of days were to rendezvous at Pong Pong Island, which is about 70 miles south of Singapore. And the rendezvous time, the time was between the 2nd and the 3rd of October. Again, the problem was there were some issues with the weather and some issues with the current. 
which meant that the, the rendezvous with the Krait by the team members was delayed. The commander of the, of the, of the Krait at the time, um, Lieutenant Cass, was instructed prior to the commencement of the mission that he would leave Singapore and head back to Australia if the teams had not arrived on the rendezvous time. Um, he was a bit reluctant to go ahead and leave the guy, so he took a, an almighty risk and stayed in the area for another day. And then he returned on the 3rd of October, which allowed the teams to, with the weather, to meet up. So they effectively met up on the 3rd of October, 1943, and successfully left the areas of Singapore and returned via the Lombok Straits heading back to Australia. Now, on the 8th of, uh, around the 8th of um, September, the vessel was still continuing south to Australia. On the 11th of September, oh, sorry, of October 1943, um, the vessel was sailing along to Australia and about 11.30 to midnight, a vessel of the Japanese Navy, a W1A102, which is a minesweeper, um, approached the, the Krite. Um, the Krite was sailing south back to Australia. The vessel did not attempt to stop the Krite. The vessel actually... Um, sailed alongside the crate on the port side, being the left-hand side, between five and ten minutes. Now, the crew was fairly alarmed with this. There was no idea. There was no persons on board who spoke Japanese. The, the vessel had been wired with 808 plastic explosives, about 70 kilos of explosives, which would have destroyed the crate and the Japanese crew if they had tried to board the vessel. Um, from history, we can't, we can't retrace the history because most of the people now are deceased, but what we believe in Navy terms, they do a thing called a watch. They do four hours on, they do two hours off, they change shift or change roster. They believe that the oncoming crew of the WA-102 uh, took little notice of a Japanese vessel flying a Japanese flag, proceeding along in a very slow motion on the water, and they peeled off and headed away from the crate. This allowed the crate to continue on, and on the 19th of October, 1943, the Krite returned back to Exmouth Gulf from the place where she had left on the mission. Okay, the, at the end of this mission, the Krite was then transferred away from Special Operations Australia and was given up to the Royal Australian Navy. The Royal Australian Navy then changed her name to HMAS Krite, Her Majesty's Australian ship, his Majesty's Australia ship. And during this time, the Krite was used to supply and support the um, Coast Watches in the New Guinea area, which was also heavily fortified by the Japanese. At the end of the war, the Krite was then sold off to a, a gentleman by the name of Richard Barrett in Borneo, who had a timber mill and timber soaring business. The Krite then went from a very very uh, famous party in military history to dragging logs up the rivers in Borneo. Ironically, at the end of the war, two Australian former commandos had become timber merchants and had decided to go to Borneo on a timber merchant exercise to purchase um, some teak to return to Australia. Whilst in Borneo, ironically, they just happened to go to the same timber yard where the vessel, which had been renamed from the Krite to the Padang, was tied up and moored in the harbour. The old Krite had had a new paint job. Uh, much of the vessel had changed in its appearance, but one of the commandos believed that the vessel that was tied in the harbour did belong to formerly the uh, Special Operations Australia. A conversation was had with Mr Barrett, and Mr Barrett confirmed the fact that at the end of the war, he did purchase the Krite from the Australian military and had used her for a number of years. Um, she was in very, very poor condition, and subsequent conversations were that uh, Mr. Barrett was going to actually destroy the crate because it was of no value to him because it needed much repair. The two commandos were quite um, concerned about this and told Mr. Barrett to place a hold on this while they returned to Australia. So the two commandos returned to Australia and they raised some funds from the Z Special Unit Association or, or an association very similar to our RSL and they raised £4,000. They then returned to Borneo and purchased the crate from Mr Barrett, and she was placed on a um, p and cargo ship, the Nellor, and returned to Australia in early 1964. Um, the vessel was um, taken off deck in Brisbane, and there was some major work done on the vessel, so she was able to travel to um, 
back to Sydney. So on Anzac Day 1964, the Crite managed to come all the way from um, Brisbane to Sydney. She was met with a um, with much fanfare in Sydney Harbour, and she was then met by the Governor of New South Wales, uh, Sir Edward Woodward, um, at the uh, pontoon steps in Circular Quay, and was classed as a deemed as a, a memorial to all our special forces during um, World War II. The vessel then from the 60s through to the mid 80s was used by what is now our coastal volunteer patrol or the volunteer coast guard as a training vessel. Um, the War Memorial in Canberra then realized the, the military significance of the vessel and took charge of the vessel in the mid 80s. Now, prior to the, um, the building of the Australian National Maritime Museum here at Darling Harbour, there was the Sydney Maritime Museum over at um, over at Dremoyne. The vessel used to live over there with a number of other vessels that are here at the Maritime Museum. The War Memorial then in 1991, when the National Maritime Museum was opened, um, transferred the Crite across from the Sydney Maritime Museum and she's resided here with us ever since. Um, she belongs to the, uh, the War Memorial in Canberra, but we are the custodian and we make sure that she's kept in safe and secure condition uh, that enables members of the public to at least visit the Crite um, on, a, on a regular basis. At the end of at the end of our um, discussion here, we've got some um, there's some interesting information in regards to the operations of the unit. There's a lot of talk of uh, Z Special Unit Z Force. Now, the, the the misnomers that have come out over the years um, have been clarified quite well. Um, our unit was the Special Operations Australia, uh, or the Services Reconnaissance Department. That was the unit that conducted special operations for Operation JWIC. Z Special Unit was a unit, um, more of a handling unit for Royal Australian Army members, and it was uh, used to, um, to formulate our Army members who were in on the mission. So technically, the Special Operations Australia Services Reconnaissance Department, from the Australian point of view, because there was British and Australians on board the mission, were responsible for providing um, the, the operatives from the Australian point of view. Hand over to you, Sally. Okay, due to the com combination of complexity surrounding SOA's establishment and organisations in wartime secrecy, reporting about titles and activities associated with have been, uh, as I just mentioned before, inaccurate and incomplete. So there is there is some good reference material at the end of the um, of the discussion, but just safely got to remember the most important thing. Special Operations Executive in Great Britain were responsible for formulating Special Operations Australia, which then became the Services Reconnaissance Department. You can see where the confusion has led. And after the war, um, colloquially, the mission was named mostly after the um, Z Special Unit, which is quite, is quite um, confusing. So for the people who really wanted to uh, learn a lot more, uh, there's quite a lot of information that we could give you some reference material at the end of the discussion. Thank you. I'll hand over to Sterling. Okay, thank you. Steve, thank you very much for that. Um, well, for the rest of this talk, I'd like to um, just talk about CampEx. As Steve uh, has already mentioned, CampEx was the uh, training facility for Operation JWIC. What made this camp unusual? It was the first camp that was established by SOE, Special Operations Executive, or Special Operations Australia, and Z Special for the training of their operatives. What makes it unique is CampEx was only built for one purpose. It was burnt, uh, built for the purpose of training Operation Joe operatives. Once the operatives have finished their training, it was abandoned and never ever used again. So if you have a look at the images on the screen here, you can see this gives you a location map to show where um, Refuge Bay is. As Steve mentioned, it's about 40 kilometers north of Sydney um, and it's up towards Broken Bay. The image on the right here shows um, uh, Refuge Bay itself. As you can see, it's an extremely picturesque location. Uh, most of the time, there's a little waterfall that flows down there with a beautiful white sandy beach. And at the very top of that cliff is where Camp X was built. And that's where the Operation Jaywick operatives were trained. 
Uh, when they were there, even though it was extremely uh, beautiful, it was very, very hard training. For the operatives to get to the camp, they had to swing climb their way up the cliff. And it was so steep that all the equipment had to be um, put on a flying fox and, and carried up to the top of the cliffs. There is a plaque, which is the one you can see in front here, that talks about Z Special Unit, and it talks about the uh, Operation Jaywick Raid, but it makes no mention of the camp itself, which is located right on the top of the cliffs. And very few people actually make the effort of climbing to the top of the cliffs where the camp was, was actually situated. So Camp X was established in 1942. Um, Ivan Lyons uh, from Special Operations Executive basically had an open checkbook. He was uh, given almost unlimited funds to actually fund the creation of this camp. He also didn't have to go through the normal uh, army uh, procurement processes. He basically had a bank account where he was able to draw funds from. So the camp was actually directly funded by SOE in London, which made it very easy for Lions to actually buy equipment to, to create the camp. And on the images here, you can see um, the actual campsite itself was uh, not a very large affair. It consisted of around about 12 canvas tents uh, that were lined up in front of a pathway with uh, the obligatory whitewashed stonework and uh, a flagpole that was uh, situated in the middle. The image on the right there is actually um, an image that shows the Crite in Refuge Bay shortly before that they uh, departed for their raid. Now, the, uh, the training that was undertaken at Camp X was extremely um, arduous. It was around about four months of, uh, of training that they undertook at Camp X. And all the trainees were told is that they were going to be trained for hazardous duties. None of the, um, the operatives themselves knew where they were going or what the, the raid was going to entail. Um, but they trained at, at Camp X for around about the four month period. Um, we don't have any uh, plans or designs of what Camp X actually looked like um, because of the secret nature of it. They tried to keep it um, very, uh, very uh, you know, secret from the rest of the services. Um, but we do have some black and white images, which is the ones that ones that you'll see here. You can see on the image on the right, there's a couple of operatives that are actually training in knife fighting techniques. They had uh, commando style knives with knuckle duster hilts, and they were using bags of chaff, which they would, uh, which they would train on. Also note that there's a, what looks like a, a boxing ring. It was called the, the bull ring, and that's where they used to do their hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Now, a big part, as Steve mentioned, of Operation J was obviously using fold boats. Now, uh, fold boats, um, there's an image on the top left-hand side there. Basically, they're a, a, a canvas-topped kayak, even though they were called canoes, but they're, they're a kayak style, rubberized uh, canvas hull, and they have wooden frames and sometimes bamboo stringers to hold them together. They seem quite fragile, but they're actually uh, extremely seaworthy craft. The great advantage of a fold boat is a train crew can basically paddle these things silently. The rubber hulls uh, absorb sand, so there's no slapping of the water. And they had single paddles, so they could get very, very low silhouette and, and sneak up on the target, which worked extremely successfully. Now, unfortunately for the operatives, when they first got to Camp X, they didn't actually have any fold boats. The fold boats uh, were on order from England and they were delayed. So they had to get creative. And on the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see uh, a wooden canoe. Um, now, this was one of the canoes that was made by the operatives when they were waiting for their fold boats to, to, to arrive. It was made out of plywood. Apparently, it was a terrible thing to paddle, but it gave them something to do. It gave them a focus and gave them something to practice with. If you also look very closely, you'll notice that cheekily, they've called it HMAS Lions after Ivan Lyons himself. So Campex was obviously needed to be near the water because there was a lot of waterborne training. Um, and once their fold boats arrived, unfortunately they didn't fit together very well. So Donald Davidson and a couple of the others had to re, you know, configure the kayaks to even get them to, uh, to work. But a great place for them to train for seaborne operations. So as I said, after about three and a half, four months, uh, the Prite actually arrived. It was running late. Um, they thought it was going to be there about two or three weeks prior to that, but it was uh, had mechanical problems, as Steve referred to. Um, and the images you can see here is that's actually the Crite when it arrived in Refuge Bay in 1943, in January. Uh, it was 
Many people say, is it Crite or Crate? Uh, it depends who you talk to, but I think it's lovely that a lot of the guys, when they first saw it, they said, oh, what an absolute crate. It just looked like this terrible fishing boat that they were going to have to, uh, to go on board. The images on the left there, as I said, most of the information that we have on CampX comes from historic photographs. Now, luckily for us, um, just before Jay, uh, the operatives left on Operation Jaywick, uh, Lord Gowry, who was the Governor General at the time, actually visited the campsite. And all these photographs that you see were actually taken at the time. So the image on the left there shows uh, Francis Chester from left to right, then Ivan Lyons, the commanding officer, then Bill Reynolds, who Steve mentioned was actually the captain of the Crite when he escaped from Singapore. Then we have uh, Donald Davidson, who was second in command, 2IC, and then Bertram Thomas Overall. Now, as Steve actually mentioned, when the Crite left here on the 18th of January 1943, one, that was the first time that the, the crews, the, the, uh, the servicemen themselves, actually were told of the operation. So prior to that, they were just told it was hazardous duties. When the Crite left Refuge Bay and basically turned left to head towards Singapore, Lyons actually told them of what the plot was. So this is the first time that they'd heard about it. Unfortunately, the Crite, as Steve mentioned, suffered mechanical problems. It was delayed and several of the uh, operatives who were training at uh, Camp X had to actually leave the operation. So the image on your seat on the left there of all those people, there was only Ivan Lyons and Donald Davidson who actually went on the final raid. So my involvement with uh, CAMPEX started in about 2015 when I was working for the state government. Now, like I said, we have no plans of what the, the site actually looked like. We didn't know what was remaining of the camp. So I was involved with a preliminary survey in 2015 where we went to CAMPEX to see if there was any remains. We did actually find that from an archaeological perspective, there's quite a lot left of the campsite itself. Fast forward to 2020, um, I established a, a project called Operation Digger. Now, Operation Digger is a voluntary community-based project designed to assist veterans' physical and mental well-being through involvement with recording archaeological and heritage sites. Um, there's been a number of projects overseas, uh, Operation Nightingale, uh, Waterloo Uncovered, for example, in the UK, where they use archaeology uh, as a, a form of recovery from, for soldiers and veterans who are suffering from PTSD, social isolation and things like that. Unfortunately, no broke projects existed in Australia at that time. Um, as an ex-defence uh, service person myself, um, I was very lucky in my service career. Uh, I was fortunate to have a very good time in the services. And, and when I left, um, I was very lucky that I, I was able to, to get out of it you know, in, in, and have a, a very good time, basically. However, some of my friends and colleagues were, were not so lucky. Some of them suffered uh, physical and uh, psychological injuries from their time in the defence forces. This got me thinking about what I could do to, to sort of help one of the things that I came up with was involving veterans in archaeological and heritage sites. So in 2020, I established Operation Digger. Now, since that time, we've undertaken a, a number of projects around New South Wales with recording heritage sites with veterans. But our first case study was Camp X. So in April 2020, I was fortunate enough to take a group of ex-commandos uh, from uh, Cottage Point, which is about 16 kilometres away to Refuge Bay in uh, four ex-military kayaks and take them to Camp X to continue the archaeological survey. Now, the idea of uh, the project that we run is that we try to introduce a physical component as much as possible. And the idea of getting veterans together, putting them in uh, fold boats, very similar to the ones that were used for Operation Jaywick and then paddling across to the site was a great way of introducing the camaraderie, the friendship, but also that physical component as well. We were also very lucky um, that National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, supported us. And the image on the right-hand side, you can see there are a couple of the park ranges. The CAMPEX site is now located uh, within Karingai Chase National Park. But at that stage, there'd been no archaeological survey and national parks didn't know what remained of the site itself. So the information that we gathered from this project and all our Operation Digger projects is given free of charge back to certain you know, institutions like the National Parks and Wildlife Service <coughs> or other cultural institutions so as they can manage and interpret these sites. 
We're also fortunate that National Parks provided us a boat, which is in the uh, image there, that was able to take less uh, able-bodied veterans over there as well uh, to the site. As I mentioned, the site itself is located within Karingo Chase National Park. Uh, the images you can see on the left there shows what the camp was like in 42, 43. You can see the tents that I was referring to before. But the image on the right shows the exact same spot uh, last year. As you can see, it's extremely overgrown. So when you first get there, you don't necessarily see a great deal. However, over the period of the surveys that we've done, we did actually identify a number of features of the site. On the right here, you can see the um, site plan, the veterans helped put together. And if you uh, look at the, the site plan, you can see where we're able to actually locate the pad stands of where all the tents were. There was basically most of the tents were around about the same size. However, we did locate one larger one, which is at the very bottom of the image there. That was the mess tent meeting hall. And at the very top um, was the bull ring or the fighting ring, which I showed you that image of um, earlier. And if you look at some of the images in front of you, you can still see in the, uh, the image at the bottom, there's the remains of the pathway that's lined with, uh, with the stones. And we also found that behind the camp itself, there's remains of a, a rifle gallery or, or a rifle range where they were obviously uh, practicing. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on small arms, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat and things like that. And after going to the site where there had been a rainstorm, we actually found some of the cartridge cases that were starting to erode out of the, out of the, uh, the, the soil there as well. Another lovely thing for the veterans particularly was uh, a number of them were searching around for the flagpole. There's these very iconic photos you can see in front here with the flagpole, and it actually had the Union Jack um, flying at the time. Uh, on our second survey, um, some of our veterans actually relocated the remains of the original flagpole, and that's sh uh, shown by the image in the left. Now, the flagpole itself has actually decayed and, uh, and fallen away, but there's now a tree that actually has grown up through that hole in the grain where the, where the flagpole uh, was. And again, I think this shows, this is the importance, I think, of taking veterans to this site. This was extremely moving for a lot of the ex-commando veterans in particular to find a, a feature like that, this and sort of relate it back to the, the commandos that had come before them. And a lot of them got a great deal of enjoyment out of actually finding this and recording this feature. So Refuge Bay itself has now um, become a little bit of a focus uh, for commemorative services. Um, as I mentioned, there's a plaque on the beach. So since we did the sur survey work, uh, we found that uh, we take uh, veterans back there each year. So we'd be very lucky in having the support of the Australian Special Forces Alliance, who's been uh, helping us do the, the survey work and Saltwater Veterans Group as well. And the images on here, I think, sort of show the, the joy that some of these veterans have have got by being at this site and doing this sort of work. On the left there, you have a couple of the veterans who uh, last year for the service took over flowers and had a small service on the beach. And the image on the right is the Saltwater Veterans Group who took over veterans to the site as well. Now, I think it's it's really important for veterans to, to go to the site because even though Operation JWIC was extremely successful and all 14 of the operatives returned safely to Australia, Six of the, the men that trained on, on Operation JWIC then went with Ivan Lyons on the second follow-up raid called Operation Make Remo. And unfortunately, all of the, the 22 that went on that raid were, were killed. Um, so six of the, the men who actually served in Operation JWIC and actually uh, some of them were trained here, um, unfortunately didn't come back. So every year we, we try to have a, a service there. This year being the 80th, there will be uh, commemorative services at Camp X. And um, also we're gonna have a commemorative service, he service here at the National Maritime Museum around the Crite as well. So I would like to thank all the, uh, the veterans who have helped record uh, Camp X. Um, without their support and help, we couldn't have actually done it. I'd like to thank the Saltwater Veterans Group, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, the Mossman RSL sub-branch, Australian Forces Special Alliance, and the mental and social health programs at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, if there's anybody that have any questions about Operation Digger or the projects that we run, uh, there's also a, a web a, a email address down there. Please feel free to, to email us anytime. 
I will just leave the references and sources up there for any other information that you would like. Um, I'd like to leave time so as we can answer any questions for you. If there's any more information we can give, please put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll try to answer those questions for you. Um, it's a project that's only recently started. Like I said, it's a, it's a volunteer project that I started with the support of veterans and veteran groups a couple of years ago, and we're slowly start, uh, starting to build up uh, projects. Um, any veterans who would like to become involved, please feel free to uh, contact me through that, that um, Operation Digger email address, and we'd love to have you involved with, uh, with other recording projects as well. Just answering your question, Robert, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, it's it's a tricky question to answer that one. The, the CRIPE belongs to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And as we've mentioned in our, in our past, it is we are custodians. The main issue that the, the War Memorial has discussed is the fact of wear and tear. Many of the other vessels that we have at the Maritime Museum, including the submarine, the Onslo, um, some of the other vessels are regularly boarded on a daily basis by our visitors. Because of the significance of the crite, the wear and tear issue is probably one of the most important aspects of why there's not regular visits. Also, the other the thing, and in, in, as we move along with changes in legislation and society, there's a WHS component. The vessel has, has not a lot of railings on board like many other vessels because of its heritage nature. To, to change a configuration of the vessel would detract from what it is. So there's the number of number of issues that um, it currently doesn't allow um, regular visits by members of the public. So that would have to be in the future, um, discussion to the War Memorial and discussion to the museum um, in, in what would occur in the future. But it doesn't mean that the vessels will not be able to be, to be visited by people in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have seen uh, seen that. I think there's a bit of poetic license in, in some of those. There are some very, very doc documentaries. Um, SBS did one a couple of years ago, and we actually have a movie here at the National Maritime Museum that talks about the raid. Um, I think they're, they're much more probably uh, historically accurate, shall, shall we say. But it is interesting. There's been so many books, uh, documentaries and movies uh, done on this raid, um, and there's you know, a lot of information out there. Only the, is, can you only get to Campex by a boat? Yes, it is. And that's one of the interesting things about it as well. The reason it was chosen um, by Ivan Lyons is it had to be a very remote location. So they wanted to be able to go around and blow things up in the bush without being uh, disturbing anyone. So they picked Refuge Bay because of its very remote nature. And as in 1942, as in today, you can only access it by water. You could potentially bush bash and get to the, the camp itself, but the only effective way is, is getting there is, is by water. Um, you can access uh, Refuge Bay with a, with a boat. If you wanted to walk up to Camp X, there's no formal pathways. It's uh, basically there's a little goat track um, that people have made to get to the top of the waterfall. Um, and that's the only way of actually uh, getting access to, to the campsite itself. I would recommend again, if people are there, it is a lovely place to visit. It's it's very beautiful place. There's a, a lovely view from the top of a waterfall. Um, and if you do go that little bit further and just walk into the bush, you probably won't see a great deal because it's very overgrown, but that is where, where the campsite is itself. And it's, uh, it's, it's accessible. Like I said, there is no formal paths, but people certainly do go up there. Yeah. A question from Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, I do understand the uh, respectful question. This this question to answer is relatively straightforward, but it does um, present some difficulties. Um, after Operation JWIC, the Japanese at the time did not have any idea whether the, the attack on Keppel Harbour was done by a submarine, whether it was done by inland commandos, or more importantly, um, by sympathisers to the Allies. And what I mean by that is the Japanese had, very similar to the Nazis, had a, uni a unit called the Kemper Tai, which was very similar to the German Gestapo. 
after the attack on Keppel Harbour, the Kemper Thai went to Changi Prison, rounded up a lot of local people um, in the in the um, on the belief that uh, they believed that the local people had been involved in um, destroying the vessels in the harbour. There's a very famous part in history called the 1010 episode on the 10th of October. Uh, the Japanese did round up these people and put them in custody. There was a large amount of people executed and tortured. And there was a very famous husband and wife by the name of Elizabeth Choi, who was taken into custody by the Japanese. Elizabeth Choi and her husband uh, ran a small business in Singapore before the war. And when our um, our servicemen and the allies were placed in Changi prison as captives, uh, she would, her and her husband would um, smuggle in food and medical equipment to try and assist our guys whilst they're in in, um, in Changi prison. So yes, the answer was there was retribution and the retribution, um, the Japanese did not really learn the full significance of Operation Jaywick until after the war. Um, subsequently, it was kept a secret um, by the military and for many, many years after World War II, uh, even people in Australia and Great Britain and Singapore really had no idea what Operation Jaywick was. Since the um, as time has gone by and we have the internet and we have Google and Wikipedia, the amount of information that's available now on JWIC is is insurmountable. So people now can actually go and read about it. But at the time, for your question, yes, the Japanese did go seeking answers to um, what occurred in um, Keppel Harbour on the 26th of September 1943. Thanks. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too that originally when uh, Jaywick uh, was such a, a success, they actually did want to use it as a propaganda tool. They wanted to say to the Japanese, "Look, we were able to get into your harbour." However, because it was so so successful, and they didn't realise where the raid had come from, they decided they would follow, try and follow up with a second raid, which was Operation Remo. Remo was a little bit different. It was much larger, um, much larger operation. Uh, instead of using fold boats, they were actually going to use what was called sleeping beauties, which were basically a submersible canoe. Uh, unfortunately, they were discovered before they got to, to uh, go on the raid and uh, they had to scuttle the, the vessel that was carrying the sleeping beauties called the Mustika, take to their fold boats and, and try to escape. Unfortunately, everyone was either killed in combat, captured uh, or, or tortured and then uh, killed just before the end of the war. So, yeah, very, um, very tragic end, unfortunately. Um, we had another couple of uh, somebody saying uh, recently recorded the diary of Horry Young, the radio operator. Yep, um, that's yeah. We, we actually have. We've been very fortunate. Horry actually did a whole uh, series where he recorded his recollections. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, so we have that at the uh, museum. We're also very fortunate that recently um, Horry's family actually donated uh, one of the uh, telephonist keys that was used, um, and that's actually just been brought into the collection, which sort of brings us to another thing. Even 80 years later, we're still finding objects associated with um, SOE and the Operation JWIC raids. We've also had some photographs that have come to light from Donald Davidson's uh, family as well, which is you know something we haven't seen for, for 80 years. So. It's amazing that stuff is still coming to light all, all these years later. Um, look, that's that's uh, something we've discussed with, with National Parks. The reports that we've been producing through Operation Digger, we give back to the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, they're, they're very good at uh, you know um, managing these sites and the information we give them helps to interpret and manage these sites into the future. I know the ranger there very, um, very well and he's um, been terrific at actually you know, managing this site. One of the things that we have been providing information for is to give them an idea where the material is in the site. Being a national park, they have to do hazard redu a reduction burns, for example. So they're develop developing a hazard reduction strategy so as they, they don't damage the site itself. Actually creating pathways up to the site, it probably would be extremely difficult because of the terrain. It's very, very rocky and very, very steep. Um, but I think that would be something that national parks would, would probably have to look at uh, themselves. Oh, yes, Bill Reynolds, did you want to answer that? It's a, a really good one. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Your question in regards to Bill Reynolds. Bill Reynolds was a civilian at the um, at the time of taking possession of the Crite. He was a merchant mariner in, this civil, in the civilian uh, world. 
during World War One, he'd been in the Navy, but that after World War One, in World War Two, he was a civilian. Now, answering your question, um, Bill Reynolds did not go on Operation Jaywick, but he then was um, seconded to do some work for the United States during the war and was eventually captured by the Japanese and executed um, before the end of World War World War II. Uh, at the end of the war, I know he was awarded um, some milita military medals in the guise of civilians. So there was, you can receive medals um, for operations in the military as a civilian. He was given a number of awards and medals to his family. Now, as far as working out whether he received any entitlements from veterans because he had been involved in the military, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I know he was awarded um, some medals. His wife was awarded medals um, at the end of World War II. Thank you. We've also had a very good question from Robert, who says, uh, what was the supply point for the camp? That's a very, a very good question. Again, one of the reasons they, they chose Camp X is the water access. It also had to be reasonably close to a, a large uh, facility. So they were supplied basically from Garden Island. Um, vessels, small uh, vessels used to go from Garden Island up to Refuge Bay to, to resupply them. Some of the supplies were dropped straight onto the beach, um, but there was actually a small wharf apparently on the far side. In one of those images I showed earlier, you can actually see a, a vessel sitting um, moored in the harbour. There was a small um, wooden pier to the right-hand side of that. So supplies could be offloaded there from larger ships and then uh, brought ashore. And like I mentioned, all their supplies had to be taken to the top of those cliffs. And as you can see, it was extremely high. So they had a flying fox system where they could pull their supplies um, back and forth. Yeah, back again there. Thank you, Ron, for your other question. There is there is a number, as I said before, with the um, with the invent of of the uh, the internet, uh, there is a lot of information that is available now on all of these gentlemen. Um, you need to you need to go and have a look on the on the Australian War Memorial site, uh, particularly for the military members of Operation J Week. There is there is information available, but I would source. I'd have a look at Google and Wikipedia um, because he was involved in military operations but he was a civilian so try having a look having a look at those um those avenues there thank you uh rob also asked did the location remain secret during the war yes it did that was another very interesting thing about this this camp was basically set up it was a bit of a boys own adventure in a lot of ways it was actually kept secret from a lot of other parts of the military um as i mentioned ivan lyons was directly financed by SOE in London. Um, so he had virtually unlimited resources. He didn't have to go through the normal supply chains. He could just buy whatever was required. So yes, it was actually kept secret from a lot of um, other parts of the military. There was a lot of jealousy. This was the very early days of special operations. Um, there was a lot of distrust and, um, you know, uh, basically because these guys were so well uh, supplied, there was a lot of um, bad feeling. So it was kept secret from a lot of other parts of the military and the camp itself it, it was a secret for, for many, many years as well. And like most things to do with Operation JWIC, it was, you know, 20 or 30 years really after the raid before a lot of information was released. And because that um, issue again with Camp X being a one-off camp, once it was once it was used for Operation uh, JWIC, it was abandoned. Um, there wasn't a lot of information uh, about it. I think the other thing is that because of its success, Operation JWIC was so successful, SOE and Special Operations Executive Australia then started creating much larger and much more formal camps. So on Fraser Island, for example, Kareem Bay in Western Australia, and also what became known as the Lugger Maintenance Section up in Darwin were very large um, Special Operations training camps. But um, Camp X is, is unique as being that first one and, uh, and a one-use camp as well. And that sort of fits with the, the mystery, I suppose, of, of uh, Operation Jaywick. So if there's, is there any other questions that we can answer or? If anyone has any questions later on, um, please feel free to, uh, to send them to the museum. Steve and I would be uh, very uh, happy to answer any questions that we can do. Just like to say, um, it's been an absolute privilege uh, working with Steve and the Maritime Museum here. The Crite is such an amazing uh, vessel. 
Obviously, it's associated with a very important part of our military history, um, and the staff and volunteers here are very passionate about um, keeping the vessel afloat and accessible to the public. Steve, in particular, is running a, a, a fantastic initiative now where we take tours down uh, to the, uh, the water side because of the, the size of the vessel and it's not really set up for visitors to get on board, uh, we have a great program where he gives a, a dockside presentation and uh, talks about the story and, and points out the features of the crime. So it's a, a great project to be working on. I would recommend if people haven't seen the crime, please come down to the museum and have a look at it. It's a, it's a wonderful vessel to, to see and try to get onto one of Steve's talks. Um, there's so much history about this, uh, the vessel on the raid that he, he goes through on those presentations. Like I said, next week is the 80th anniversary of Operation JWIC, and we will be having a service um, at the museum as well. So if anybody's around at that time, it runs from 9 till 11, um, please feel free to come down to the museum and, and help us uh, you know, commemorate this very significant event. Again, very <laughs> apologies for the technology issues. Um, it's just unfortunate that uh, unfortunately it didn't, uh, the technology just wasn't working with us today. Um, but look, thank you all very much for, for joining us. Um, like I said, it's, it's wonderful that we can have these presentations and get information across to people. Uh, like I said, we have the 80th anniversary events coming up. Um, please feel free to come down to the museum, see the crate for yourself uh, and hear more about the, uh, the fantastic story that is, that is Operation J Week. Um, I think. This, when is the service at the museum? We have another question. Um, it's on the 26th and it runs from 9 a.m. to 11. And it's going to be uh, where the Christ is moored in front of the, the Maritime Museum here at Darling Harbour. And once again, thank you all for tuning in and um, and bearing with the uh, the commun communication issues. But um, yeah, thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, and thank you very much, Steve, for, thank you, for giving you your perspective. It's fantastic. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>